What's up guys, gals, and other, please specify. Welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. There <laughs> are too many revenge subreddits, man. All right, this story's called Fairly Aggressive Girlfriend Stole From My Bank Account So I Sent Her Academic Career Into A Nosedive. I'm a senior at a large state university. This happened in the first semester of my freshman year. I was elected for an honors type program that placed me in a co-ed dorm building with every other student in the program. As a dumb freshman, I rushed into a relationship with a freshman girl who lived right above me. We'll call her Megan. It was convenient for me to date someone who lived so close, but everyone else in our building hated Megan because she talked a lot and almost exclusively about herself. She bragged often about being a fairly aggressive person, but somehow I overlooked that mile-wide red flag. Right after Thanksgiving break, at the end of an evening class, I got a call from my mom who noticed some unusual activity on my checking account. Back then, I had no credit card, so this account debit card was my only access to my savings while I lived on campus. I rarely needed to buy anything during the semester, so I was puzzled to find that $104.29 had left my bank account over two weeks in the form of six Grubhub food orders. At this point, I trusted Megan, but I decided to ask her about the money right away. She denied any involvement and suggested that I cancel my debit card. After a really long phone call to the bank, I did just that. Next, I reached out to Grubhub customer service on Twitter. Hey, uh, my card was stolen and used for food orders on these dates. Can I have the receipts? They sent me the first and last receipts, but they had to redact the personal info of the account holder. I say redact in quotes because they just used the Snapchat draw tool and Megan's name was still clearly visible on both receipts. What's more, the most recent receipt was only two hours old. She was probably still eating when I chopped up my debit card. It's worth noting that she and I both had unlimited dining plans, paid for by our respective parents, and we lived 500 feet from the nearest dining hall. She didn't need to order food, and she definitely didn't need my money to do it. So I texted her again. I have the receipts from Grubhub. Are you sure you didn't make those orders? A reply? Screw you for suspecting me! Fairly aggressive, wouldn't you say? I hatched a plan to collect security camera footage of her picking up the order from that evening. However, by midnight, Megan arrived at my door in tears and confessed to everything. Plus, she admitted to being a serial shoplifter. Exhausted, I sent her away and decided to deal with everything in the morning. By the next day, everyone in our building seemed to know what was going down, probably because Megan had already begun broadcasting her version of the story. I sent Megan a breakup text and decided that the $104.29 was a loss. At least I escaped unscathed, right? Well, less than two days later, she entered my room when I wasn't looking. I was sitting at my desk when I noticed her standing silently behind me. Give me my stuff! Where's my stuff? What stuff? You know! I did not know. She tore through the room, looking for something that she refused to identify. Just as quick as she came, she was gone. And I locked the door because obviously this wasn't over yet. Within a minute, she was back. She stood outside my door, knocking and demanding I let her back inside. The knocking quickly got more violent. She started shouting, I know you're freaking in there! Open the mother-loving door! Mind that we lived in this building with students in our program who all knew each other, and all of them could hear her. Pretty quickly, Megan was rattling the handle of my door. Next, she began throwing herself at it, shoulder first, trying to break it down. I lived next door to my residential advisor, but judging by the lack of any intervention, he was elsewhere. So I whipped out my phone and texted him to send backup. Meanwhile, I saw my heavy wooden door bending and buckling. 
I even heard it crack a little. My RA was on duty in another building, so he sent three of his colleagues to de-escalate the situation. They brought Megan downstairs, where she revealed that the stuff she wanted was just the t-shirt and keychain that she gave me for my birthday. Whatever, I let her have those. I still just wanted this to be over. However, once I shared my story with the resident life staff, they filed university paperwork to place a no-contact order between me and Megan. They also recommended I contact the campus police, who then told me I should get my stolen money back in small claims court. I couldn't even get there without a car or money to pay for an Uber. Sorry, Judge Judy. At the request of the campus police, I also contacted the Title IX office at my school, sending them the story of everything you've read so far. They were interested, to say the least. Although I didn't want any trouble. I just wanted a clean breakup and a fresh start, but a Title IX representative informed me that they were bringing three misconduct charges against Megan. Theft, threatening and violent behavior, and inciting an intervention by university staff. The representative asked me to serve as a witness in Megan's disciplinary hearing the next semester. I tentatively agreed right before the representative set the hearing date for February 14th, Valentine's Day. I thought it was a joke, but they really did that. When the day of the hearing finally arrived, the no contact order was still in effect, but a few of my friends had kept tabs on Megan. For starters, she failed all of her classes in the fall. Someone in my math course confessed that Megan had tried to sleep with him while she was dating me, and he had to repeatedly tell her no. Even worse, Megan kept telling a twisted version of the whole story to try and turn my friends against me. So, when I found out that she had a new boyfriend, it felt good to know that the Valentine's Day disciplinary hearing ruined whatever evening plans they might have made. I arrived alone at the disciplinary board office, unsure of what to expect. The board consisted of grad students, and the hearing was expected to run into the night. Unlike me, Megan did not come alone. She brought both of her parents as character witnesses. That wasn't even a thing here. This wasn't a real courtroom, as you'll soon see. And that's not all. Megan's parents also paid a lawyer to defend her against the charges. The board knew that was unnecessary, but Megan's parents believed so strongly in their daughter's innocence that they had already paid this three-piece suit to make her case. In the name of fairness, the boards offered me pro bono legal representation. A junior economics major who we'll call Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy had already read my account of the events from the fall, and thanks to my screenshots of Grubhub receipts, he said there was an okay shot of the charges sticking. Then I told him something I'd kept secret for months. When Megan tried to break down my door and I whipped out my phone to text my RA, I also filmed the whole thing. Jimmy couldn't get enough of the video. There was Megan, kicking and screaming and clearly trying to break into my dorm room. It was all the evidence I needed and no one saw it coming. In the hearing, when the time came for me to make the case against Megan, Jimmy played the video on a big screen in front of everyone. The room went insane. In that instant, I realized that Megan really had convinced everyone that I was the liar. In her version of the story, I gave gave her permission to buy food using my account. She told her parents that she'd asked me politely for her belongings, which I had rudely hidden from her in my dorm room. In Megan's story, I was the sociopath trying to ruin her reputation. Before I unveiled the video, it was her word against mine. I still didn't want revenge, even after finding out that Megan tried to cheat on me. But when I saw her parents flipping out at the video, why didn't you tell us you did this? And her lawyer raised hell, this evidence was not provided in pre-trial disclosure, and a board member standing over him, Sir, this is not a court of law. Please return to your seat. And him shouting, OBJECTION! And her replying, We don't have objections! This isn't a court of law! And Jimmy, my new best friend, just trying not to laugh out loud. That's when I realized how good revenge can feel when it's fair and deserved. The board found Megan responsible on all three charges. My side 
side of the bench recommended the university terminate her housing contract and force her to pay restitution. Her side recommended only restitution and a reprimand. The board compromised. Her family paid back most of the money she stole. Most, because two of the six orders had the same price, and the lawyer convinced the board I had duplicated an order. And Megan was forced to move into a different dorm building. This probably would have helped her anyway, because every student in the program's building knew everything she'd done and lied about. They wouldn't speak to her, and no one wanted to be her roommate. By the time she had to move buildings, she'd already failed all of her courses again. Having paid for her tutor, her unused dining plan, her lawyer, and her restitutions, Megan's parents finally pulled her out of school. Where are they now? Last I heard, Megan returned as a part-time student, but I never saw her again because the no-contact order still stands. I'm now Facebook friends with the guy Megan tried to seduce. Oh, and uh, Jimmy and I are connected on LinkedIn. As for me, well, I no longer date fairly aggressive people. Wow. Um, yeah, that story, <laughs> that escalated really quick. The whole trying to bust the door down thing, what I've heard is that like a lot of time when toxic people uh, are broken up with, they'll try to find any excuse to like confront that person kinda. And that t-shirt or whatever the hell she was looking for is just an excuse to, you know, do what the hell she did. Anyway, uh, that was a really cool story. I appreciate OP's um, sense of mercy because that's admirable, man. All right, this story's called Trick Me Out of My Laptop, You'll Give Me Your Car. 13 years ago, I was in my late teens, living on my own and really struggling to live financially. One of the few possessions I had was an old laptop. My laptop had stopped working properly, and while I'm fairly proficient in using a computer, I had no idea about fixing them. I did a bit of searching on the internet, but couldn't get it working, so I asked my stepdad to take a look. He has a quick look and says it's screwed up, but he'll take it off my hands if I don't want it. So I said, sure, if it's broken, then it's no good to me. Ten minutes later, I walk in the room and he's using it. I asked if he fix it, and he says, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the laptop. I was obviously pissed. My mom says she wasn't getting involved, and his only response was that he did a quick internet search to find the fix and I could have done the same. I was broke, and he took one of my only possessions, even though he had a PC and a laptop already. A few months later, I was visiting my mom and stepdad when I had an idea. While I am useless with computers, I'm very competent with mechanics specifically Audis, and my stepdad had a 2001 Audi A3. Before coming in the house, I went under his car and unplugged the oil level sensor and vac line for the turbo. Later on that day, he went to go to the shop or something. When he started the car, it threw up oil warning lights on the dash and wouldn't boost, so he turned it off and had a look of concern on his face. I went out to ask what's up, and he said that something had gone majorly wrong. He says something along the lines of catastrophic turbo failure or engine failure. He's already spent quite a bit on repairs and didn't want to spend any more money on it. So spoke to my mom about just cutting his losses and scrapping it. I asked him how much it's worth at the scrapyard and he says a hundred pounds. So I ever so graciously offer 120 pounds to take it off his hands to maybe part it out, which he accepts. He signed over the logbook title and wrote me a receipt of purchase and handed the keys over. I I walk outside, lifted the bonnet, pretended to look at my phone for a minute, went under the car and plugged the vac line and oil sensor back in, fired it straight up and drove around the block. When I got out, I gave him the thumbs up and said it's all fine now. His mouth was wide open and he was mega pissed, and my reply was, you could have found the solution too with a quick internet search. He tried arguing that it wasn't fair and if it's working then I can't just take his car but I just said he didn't have a problem tricking me out of my laptop and that he's already signed the car over to me, so tough luck. My mom kinda laughed and said she's not getting involved and that it was his own fault. I still have the car to this day and it's practically in showroom condition and runs sweet. And then here's an edit to guys and gals and other please specify. Wow, I didn't expect that to, that wasn't planned. 
it's not that unbelievable. I tricked someone into thinking their car was broken so I could have it. Yes, it's 100% true. Yes, I know I'm a butthole and I don't deny that it was a douche move, but I thought people might get a kick out of a bit of revenge. I did. <laughs> What a dummy. You know what? I 100% approve of this. stepdaddy -o there knew what kind of game he was playing, and he got beat. All right, this story's called, I Tainted My R Rude Female Boss's Phone. Pre-Brovid, some years ago, I had an awful boss who spent every single day shopping online, napping, spending company money on personal expenses, texting on her phone, smoking cigarettes, and shamelessly hitting on male customers to manipulate them into buying things and thereby boost her sales number. She was married, snobby, and all around, holier than thou. On paper, as far as the company was concerned, she looked great. In reality, she left all of the actual day-to-day -day work to me and shamelessly took all of the credit while casually putting me down to our district manager behind my back. This went on for years. One day, I tried to call in sick, which was very rare. I had been up all night coughing and had a fever. She had berated me over the phone, saying that I had to come in because she had an important sales meeting and that calling in sick wasn't an option. Reluctantly, I came in, obviously sick. She left for her meeting and came back half a day later with booze on her breath and a pile of paperwork, which she promptly and unapologetically handed over for me to do. I was somewhat suspicious as all of it was dated from a week prior and looked like it may have been stuffed under a company truck seat. As usual, she made her way back to her office where she turned out the light and took one of her many naps. I crap you not. Toward the end of the day, the customer called and we picked up at the same time. It was her husband and I overheard them talking about how he had fun on their lunch date and was glad she had bailed on her sales call. I politely hung up and pretended to be none the wiser. When she went to the bathroom, I snuck into her office, pulled her office phone off the ringer, and and rubbed the receiver all over my taint and sweaty sick boy balls. Oh boy. Long story short, I got better by that evening. She caught my cold and called out the next day. Some months later, I transferred store locations and without me there to blame, another few months went by and she was fired for negligence and I was promoted. I no longer work there, but in the end, went much, much farther than she ever did and ended up quitting on my own terms many years later. Gross? Unprofessional? Absolutely. I would never do that again. It was a moment of petty and disgusting spitefulness on my part. But do I regret it? Nah, screw her. <laughs> That's kind of funny. I love that title so much more now. He tainted it. Get it? He ru You get it. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.